Let me begin by introducing the, the important academic footnote that goes on every journal article, which is any remaining errors or omissions from this study are solely the responsible of John Page and Finn Tarp. Uh, <laughs> so let me talk a little bit about some of the overview ideas that are coming out of this project. The first is that, as you know, Africa has uh, grown pretty rapidly since 2000, in fact, uh, happily so. But manufacturing hasn't been a driver of the structural transformation that we see as, uh, that has occurred there as it happened in other regions. And this has led some, uh, some observers to take the view that the growth prospects for Africa is somewhat dim. In fact, our argument is somewhat different. We argue, in fact, that the changes in global, the global economy, together with the different economic structure of Africa itself, mean that the region is not likely to replicate the manufacturing-led growth of East Asia. But these same changes in the global economy are likely to lead to new opportunities for the region, which if realized with positive policies can have much of the same effect. One of the opportunities we think is developing what we call industries without smokestacks. I'll talk about what those activities are in a minute. But while norm not formally manufacturing in some cases, they have many of the characteristics of, uh, that would power productivity growth and could lead to uh, a return to uh, or a continuation of high growth rate. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the question is, can the high growth that we've seen since 2000, and by the way, it's not exceptionally high growth. We're talking about two, two and a half percent uh, per capita income uh, over the period 2000 to 2010, let's say, and then from 2010 to 2015, prospects have dimmed a little bit or growth rates have fallen slightly uh, under that, particularly because of the uh, impact of the oil exporting economies uh, and the fallen commodity prices uh, that have come, come since. Uh, there has been a bit of a pickup in uh, recent years, and particularly in the non-resource uh, exporting countries, we find uh, a continuation of pretty high growth. But there's reasons to be pessimistic, and that perhaps is uh, spelled out most clearly by, by this quote from Danny Roderick. Uh, he wrote in 2014, there is a genuine question about whether Africa's growth can be sustained. I come down on the pessimistic side due to what I think are the poor prospects for industrialization. And by industrialization, uh, he means manufacturing. Why is manufacturing important? Well, it is important. Uh, it employs large numbers of unskilled people. Uh, it has relatively high productivity potential because of scale economies. And innovations uh, in process and products create opportunities uh, uh, for productivity improvement, the kind of monkeys and trees argument uh, that Ricardo Hausman has put forward. And why is trade in manufacturing important? Well, manufacturing is a leading growth, in a really growth sector in international trade. Uh, and trade is also necessary to achieve higher economies of scale, particularly on the export side. You think about an economy the size of Rwanda, it basically has a GDP uh, the size of the city of Nottingham, England. Uh, and so in order to be efficient, firms have to export in order to re reach scale. And similarly, Trade means that they have access to imports uh, at, and uh, technology at uh, lower cost. So trade is exceedingly important to the development of manufacturing. And then finally, uh, trade is really important for uh, allowing economies to specialize on the one hand, specialize in production, but also to diversify their consumption through, through imports. So that's why trade in manufacturers is important. Well, let's take a look at the Roderick pessimism. Uh, indeed, industry is not a leading growth in Africa. And historically, we've seen that in other countries, particularly in Asia, it's played a pretty dramatic point. This, this graph shows the share of manufacturing in uh, GDP value added uh, in 2016, just as a snapshot. And if you did the same picture, by the way, in 2008, it would look pretty much the same. Those circled countries are the East Asia countries. They're really uh, doing extremely well in manufacturing, and they have very high shares of uh, manufacturing GDP. On the other hand, if you look at Africa, you see that some of its fastest growing countries, in fact, are located below the line. They're not growing uh, very rapidly uh, at all. That, uh, the, uh, that is, the share of manufacturing and share of GDP uh, has not been uh, dominant. Similarly, if you looked at the share of GDP, uh, manufacturing and GDP over time, this shows it from 1960 to 2016, you'd see a number of things. The first is that uh, uh, the Africa share of uh, global manufacturing, which is what this graph shows, uh, is smaller today than it was in the 1980s. Uh, in fact, uh, manufacturing share of G GDP in 1980 was something close to 13% uh, of GDP. It has now subsequently fallen to on the order of 9% of GDP. Uh, 
Per capita manufactured exports are only about 10% of developing country average. Uh, and today, Africa's share of, global, of, of manufacturing GDP is less than half the average uh, of all developing countries. If we look at where uh, the peak of that curve uh, is across countries, we see that uh, the peak share of manufacturing as a share of GDP, uh, increasing and then beginning to fall, has actually peaked at a much lower levels uh, of GDP than uh, what we see for high-income countries. Those blue dots on the right are high-income countries share when they peaked, and that would have been several uh, decades ago. Uh, Middle-income countries are the green countries, uh, and then uh, the, the orange and yellow countries are those where uh, uh, manufacturing has already peaked and begun to decline as a share of GDP. So uh, this clearly is a challenge uh, for, for the region. We'd argue that changes in the global economy of the world, that is the global uh, economy, make reliance on manufacturing uh, a la East Asia, uh, a difficult path to follow, uh, at least in lockstep. Why do we say this? Well, first of all, manufacturing as a GDP is falling at all levels of per capita income. Uh, this graph shows manufacturing of GDP on average uh, over the four decades, 1980 to 2010, with a log of GDP per capita on the uh, x-axis. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, each decade has shown a fall in manufacturing share across, uh, across the world. And there are several reasons for this. Uh, most importantly, perhaps, is the rapid growth of the service sector everywhere. Uh, but that also is associated with issues uh, uh, that are bound up with manufacturing itself. Companies uh, have begun to outsource uh, certain activities into specialized parts of the service sector. So for example, advertising is frequently uh, outsourced to a particular agency, uh, and that's beginning to show up in this statistic. Simultaneously, what shows up in this graph are the emergence of the large tech companies, Amazon, for example, uh, uh, reaching trillion dollar capitalization. Uh, Apple, similarly, uh, a very large company. Only a portion of what they do, uh, certainly not in the case of, of Amazon, but in the case of Apple is actually associated with manufacturing. In fact, most, much of the manufacturing that Apple does is done elsewhere. A second change in the global economy that I think uh, alters the uh, opportunities for African manufactured uh, manufacturing is the emergence of China. This graph to me is utterly astounding. If you look on the right-hand side, this is the share of global manufacturing uh, value added uh, and uh, uh, over, this, over this period. And you see that uh, uh, as a share of the global manufacturing value added, the high income share in the space of 1994 to 2015 has fallen from maybe 80% down to on the order of about 50%. I mean, this is astounding development. Where is that going? Well, it's going largely to China. I'm delighted, by the way, that Justin Lin is here because he knows, uh, of course, China and this whole picture very, very well. Uh, what we see is uh, uh, manufacturing moving to China and becoming very efficient in, uh, uh, the global, in global markets. Other regions have not expanded so rapidly. Other countries in East Asia have, done, uh, have gotten a share of that market, so they're very important as well. Uh, Europe has not seen quite the Europe and, and Central Asia uh, has sort of uh, been about the same, uh, the same levels. Latin America, likewise, is not changing. On the right-hand side, Africa has uh, barely registered as a blip in this process. But what this means is that the nature of the global market has changed considerably from the epoch and when uh, Japan and, and Korea uh, entered the global market. A third change that we point to, I think, is the emergence of global value chains uh, and the opportunities uh, for trade in tasks. That is, segments of the production process uh, move around the world, and increasingly, the process of globalization has created the opportunities uh, uh, and uh, necessity of joining global value chains. If we look at, for example, Vietnam over on the right-hand side, we see that their participation in global value change is extraordinarily high. It's some uh, 35% uh, here, uh, using the average share of foreign value added in exports uh, over the period 2008 to 2012. If, on the other hand, you look at uh, the countries arrayed to the left of this graph, the African countries, uh, you see that most fall below even the average for low-income countries' participation in global value chains. That is, there is uh, uh, a necessity, in fact, for countries that want to participate in the global marketplace uh, via manufacturing to hook up with global value chains in a way that may, may not have existed before. <clears throat> 
These same forces, however, that are changing and creating uh, new opportunities for uh, uh, Africa uh, or creating difficulties for Africa to get into the international market are also creating new opportunities. Uh, I mentioned the trade and task segmentation of global value chains. Make production for export suddenly accessible uh, in ways that it might not have been before. Moreover, the services, which are uh, uh, rapidly expanding in developing countries, as they are in, in rich countries, are a more dynamic sector of global trade. Thirdly, scale barriers in services markets are, more, are, are virtually negligible or, af or, or absent. So Africa can get into this market at an early stage. It doesn't take too, you can set up a consulting operation in uh, your neighboring country, as we have seen, uh, let's say, the company of Laterite do from uh, moving from Rwanda to uh, Uganda and Ethiopia. Uh, uh, there's, no, there's no scale barriers to do that. Similarly, there's another opportunity, of course, is as wage, wages rise in China, the Chinese are looking for new locations for their manufacturing plants. The question is, will Africa be a destination? And we've seen in some countries, particularly Ethiopia, uh, that, uh, that they, in fact, are, are moving there. Uh, these factors suggest that together with falling transportation and communication costs, there are opportunities. And one of the opportunities we're, we were interested in exploring is what we call industries without smokestacks. So let's take a look at that. Here, what we're talking about is the fact that technology and transportation costs uh, allow for the new entrance into new uh, areas where many of the, uh, uh, these activities share some of the same characteristics of manufacturing. What are we talking about? For example, horticulture or agro-processing or food processing. Tourism. Other forms of tradable surpluses, such as information and communication. Many of these, like manufacturing, uh, employ large numbers of unskilled workers. They have relatively higher productivity potential in which innovation can lead to new and ongoing opportunities, if differently articulated, by the way, as between firms and between sectors. And these sectors are also a growing segment of, of international trade. If, just to give you some uh, readout of some of the examples that we see from, uh, that come out of the book and its case studies, uh, take the example of horticulture, uh, uh, and we'll get a little bit more uh, uh, from both uh, uh, the presentation that will follow uh, uh, here, but uh, on agriculture. What we see is that uh, exports have nearly doubled of horticulture exports uh, as a share of uh, sub-Saharan African agricultural exports between 1990 and 2014. Horticulture exports are up in Ethiopia, Senegal, Ghana, and South Africa, uh, to name a few. And they're generally outperforming other uh, forms of exports. Agro-processing is another area. It's grown to 35% of Sub-Saharan African exports, although this is still low uh, relative to potential, and I'm sure that uh, the presentation that will follow will, will go into this in some degree. Tourism uh, amounts to uh, uh, an estimated 3% of Sub-Saharan Africa GDP uh, in South Africa. Uh, this is, uh, uh, in South Africa, it reaches 680,000 jobs, or 36% of the entire food and beverage industry, uh, according to the case study that we have. In Tanzania, tur tourism accounts for directly or indirectly 14% of GDP and 3% of employment. In Rwanda, tourism at 22% has expanded 22% annually in the last decade and is now the largest earner of foreign exchange. In Rwanda, which is in the center uh, of, of Africa. Uh, I should say quickly that the numbers on tourism, I think, are underdeveloped. Uh, we really need to do much more work in looking at the actual consequences because I think the numbers we get at the border every time you fill out one of those little cards or even do it electronically now, it's not very clear that this gets tabulated correctly and certainly in, in many countries around the world. Business services also are beginning to be important. Kenya, for example, as you know, has uh, pioneered mobile money uh, that's really revolutionizing cross-border financial flows. Uh, call centers, uh, I had the opportunity to go through KenCall, for example, uh, in uh, Nairobi at one point, and uh, it is a fundamentally a dramatic thing that these people have done. These expats that came out from the diaspora came back to open up an, uh, an enterprise uh, originally with a small number of people, and now they're employing in the hundreds. Mobile money subscription, just to give you an indication of how fast things have grown, rose tenfold between 2011 to reach virtually uh, half of the population in Rwanda by 2014, and have now, of course, gone much, uh, grown much faster. The opportunities in mobile money, I think, we're just beginning to, to explore. In Senegal, there was a little different story. Actually, it's mirrored by, by events in Botswana as well. 
that uh, because of the, uh, uh, the backbone infrastructure being uh, a monopoly, uh, the, the industry which began very well in call, uh, call centers actually uh, didn't progress very well. But what did happen, uh, we see coming out of the, uh, uh, the case studies, is that the software that was designed for use in some of this, uh, I think, uh, began to sell, sell abroad. Uh, Finally, transportation services are becoming very important with new investments in ports, roads, and air facilities. I should mention that there's, pretty, there's some sharp risks with this. Uh, the risks are that uh, uh, you can get excessive investments in public infrastructure. We've seen in air transport now the state, uh, state enterprise airlines coming in. We have a nice chapter in the book on this, uh, which tends to lead to uh, overinvestment in, in the industry and declining profitability across the sector. All of Africa's air transport is about equal to the three airports in Washington, D.C. in an annual basis of, of traffic held, just to, just to link it. We see overinvestment in some of the other sectors as well. Uh, other concerns include tax incentives, monopoly positions that are used to encourage ent entry, and trade reducing beggar thy neighbor policies uh, through industry. This is something we, we might come back to. Industries without smokestacks indeed have become much more important. Uh, we did a, a little calculation uh, where we could put together for 33 countries uh, the, 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 the data set for the most countries that we could put together from 2002 to 2015. And what we see is that the industries without smokestack sectors, if we want to call them that, grew at least as fast as traditional sectors in two thirds of the countries. Uh, and faster in half of the countries. I should mention there's a lot of variation around these lines. Not everybody, as I mentioned, half the countries uh, didn't grow faster, but uh, uh, this, this is a phenomenon that in fact is far reaching in Africa when, when nearly two thirds of the countries can uh, take advantage of this opportunities. And this happens at both ends of the scale, even at small countries uh, as well as large countries. A second point here that's important that comes out of the study is the importance of regional integration in part because the, these uh, regional integration offers the opportunity to become springboards into uh, global manufacturing uh, and to regional development. Take a look at this graph. The top graph shows the value of exports in sub-Saharan Africa by sector from 1998 to 2013 of all exports. Uh, and what you see is that uh, manufacturers' share, share of that is, uh, while increasing in absolute terms, uh, is still the smaller portion of this. However, if you look at what's happening at the regional level and just look at intra-regional trade, you see a much sharper uh, uh, pattern of uh, manufactured exports coming out as a consequence of uh, uh, regional exports and intra-regional trade. Just to give you a number, in Rwanda, for example, some 70% of non-traditional exports uh, generally go to uh, the DRC and to uh, other countries in the region. Similarly, this uh, regional integration offers new uh, opportunities in the, what we'll call the IWIS sectors, trade and surpluses. We, we've seen the opportunities emerging from cross-border trade and finance. I hope Luis will talk about this a little bit. Uh, more importantly, intra-industry competition in differentiated products is going to be terribly important for driving economies of scale and creating uh, bigger enterprises. For that to happen, countries within a region have to allow that competition uh, to occur because it's only that way that you can drive productivity within sectors. Where the book uh, goes through some policies. I won't have time because John is flashing me these cards over there uh, to uh, uh, go into these in, in details. But we, the book goes through global policies, country level policies, and regional policies. Let me say a point just about global policies. I think. Uh, the interests of developing countries uh, in the multilateral trade negotiations are reaching, uh, are becoming acutely apparent. Uh, with the uh, uh, unraveling of the multilateral system that's being induced by the uh, uh, ill-considered policy of the United States, uh, I think the smaller countries in the world have a new interest in multilateralism and particularly the African countries. They're going to have to work particularly with the BRICS because the BRICS will have access in the multilateral system in making the WTO a success. We see this in the TPP discussions. It has been amazing to me to watch the 11 countries in the discussion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Alliance uh, uh, come together and form a new regional agreement without the United States. And I think this is a terribly important uh, development at the multilateral level. 
At country level, there's also, of course, need policies, and these will be uh, uh, definitive and in, in ultimately in shaping the success or failure of Africa's efforts in both the eyewitness sectors and, and traditional manufacturing. Uh, here, the industrial policy story is really important. Again, I mentioned Justin Lin on this, uh, in, this, in this venue. I think what's, what's important and what's critical is to think about industrial policies that are pro-competitive, that encourage entry, rather than policies which are restrictionist and impede entry, because the, the outcomes are entirely different uh, in historical experience, and, and we can talk about that. Finally, regional integration is, being very, is, is, is very important. Interconnecting infrastructure creates the opportunity for countries to have access uh, to Ethiopia's uh, very low power that will come out of the low cost power, that will come out of the new dams that they're putting in place. Uh, this will be very important for the countries that are trying to manufacture because manufacturing costs at 20 cents a kilowatt hour are simply too high to allow uh, African manufacturers to be competitive at the global level. So what's our conclusion? One, I think Africa indeed can create its new growth mi miracle, uh, but its form is likely to be much different than, than East Asia. Relying more on productivity improvements in agriculture, natural resources, yes, that's important. Within sector, productivity importance are as, more, as important as moving resources out of agriculture into the other sectors, and industries without smokestacks will be important. Secondly, policies should not focus obsessively on manufacturing or ignore manufacturing. Key growth, uh, keys to growth will be policies that promote higher productivity act, uh, activities and exports in both services and in manufacturing. And finally, regional integration will assume an ever greater importance as a source of demand uh, for exports. So policy coordination to lower the cost of trading, uh, foster region-wide competition, and encourage open regionalism will be of great import. Thank you.